Hello everybody and welcome. I'm glad you are joining me, Josie, your host on the Photoplacine podcast. This time I chat to Robin Shelton about his lifetime love of photography inspired by his father, a career that has spanned silversmithing, teaching and writing books, including one about life at an allotment and how being hands-on with nature is nurturing for our own well-being. We spoke about Robin's passion for the sea and a new project he hopes to get off the ground relating to sewage pollution in our rivers and seas using the salt printing process and the contaminated water. How his new dark room in the garden has become a plant graveyard where he creates some of his horror hortus work plus so much more. I love one expression Robin used in particular about creating eco-conscious photographic art and other art, and that's making with meaning. Listen in to hear how Robin melds this into his practice. Well, I'm joined on this Photopacine podcast by a photographer named Robin Shelton who I'm very excited to have taking part and chatting with me today. I think we've actually got quite a lot in in common. We're both based in the the West Country. Um, We both like to work with with other creatives and artists. And um, there is a a love of allotments there as well, which we'll hopefully chat about. So, Robin, thank you so much for joining me today. Pleasure. Thanks for having me, Josie. No, pleasure is all mine. I really appreciate you taking the time. My dad was was really into photography. He was a very keen mm-hmm. amateur photographer, uh, loved his kit. Uh, and he had a Canon A1 that I was always desperate to get my hands on, but never quite <laughs> managed to. Um, but no, I think when I was a little boy, I, I, I grew up with a camera in my hand. I think you know, like a lot of little boys, I sort of idolised my dad and yeah. wanted to be like him a little bit. So I think that that got me into photography. And it was just always something that struck me as a very natural, normal thing to do. Uh, mm. And I think when it when it came to actually, because uh, my family are all sort of involved in the arts and it was something that, I, that was always very natural for me. And I think when it came to me studying for a degree, I, I didn't ever really consider photography as a degree because mm-hmm. it was just something that I did. I didn't really sort of think that I needed, not very arrogant by the sounds of it, but <laughs> I don't think I ever really considered that, 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 that doing photography was something that you studied for. It was just something that you did. It was just a yes. normal thing for me. Uh, so that's really where it came from, that sort of passion for having the camera in my hand. I think that also, uh, as, as I'm the youngest of three children, and I think that when you're the youngest of, of uh, a set of siblings, quite often you're, you, you, you sit and watch. I think you mm. watch the, the, the mistakes that your siblings make and you think, well, I'm not going to do that. That, that, <laughs> that gets me into trouble. So I think that I was very much an observer from a young age. I, I grew up in the countryside, a uh, very rural existence. So there wasn't an awful lot to do. So if I didn't have a camera in my hand, I had a pair of binoculars bird watching and that sort of thing. So Brilliant. it was just something that, that, that was always, it was like a, a natural extension of myself to have a camera in my hand, really. So that's where it came from. Yeah, I totally, uh, yeah, I love the the sort of idea that, um, that you say, sort of the, your dad's influence there, um, but not being able mm. to quite get your hands on his camera. <laughs> <laughs> it disappeared. He, he, now, he, so. he, he, died, he died very young and it, it, it disappeared oh. after he died. I think that there's maybe an element of that, I think, because he died when I was quite young. I was 16 when he went. So I think that yeah. may, maybe there was an element, an, element, an element of trying to sort of... <laughs> Um, forge some sort of legacy out of that I don't know some sort of sentimental yeah. attachment to photography maybe perhaps so how did you go from obviously you've come back then almost full circle into photography how did you um, decide then that silversmithing and jewellery was the because I believe you after you studied that degree did you actually also teach so yeah I was I was teaching on further education in tertiary education teaching art and design and graphics and design technology uh, I was doing that for two or three years um, and the various circumstances conspired to, to, to ensure that I couldn't do it anymore uh, mm-hmm. since then I've been self-employed as various things uh, as an artist and photographer and a bit of gardening uh, to keep things going um, I wrote a couple of books uh, that got published in 2006 2008 
the first one was about my allotment, which I believe we're going to have a chat about at some point. Yes. Um, so really, it wasn't it, photography was never something that I really came back to because I never really left it. It was always yes. something that I was always doing. Uh, I, there's always been a camera somewhere, at least one camera, and heaven knows how many I've got now. Um, <laughs> I've lost, I've honestly lost count. Um, but yeah, it was something that was always I always use photography as an adjunct to what I was doing creatively so sometimes it was a research tool uh, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, I would I would actually make photographs and exhibit them and sell them so they'd be objects in their own right mm -hmm. uh, but it's something which has always been current uh, so it never really felt like I was coming back to it it was just a, a shift in a way and I think that yeah. the, 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 the digital revolution I mean how, how, how long can we talk about that and, and what effect it's had I mean it's just been seismic um, yeah. And I suppose that I, I, I really, if I said I got back into photography seriously in 2001, that's when I really picked up an SLR and thought, yeah, I could do something with this. And that mm -hmm. was at a time when digital was just coming in. So there was that debate raging of film versus digital, which is absolute nonsense, yeah, yeah. obviously. Um, so, yeah, it's just something which... Um, I wouldn't ever rule anything out. I think that I'd always say, yeah, I'll probably make some jewellery again. I'll, I'll probably draw again. I'll probably do all sorts of things again. It's just a question of time and having the right amount of time. <laughs> yeah, time is that is always, I think, always our challenge, isn't it? Sort of, uh, For sure. Yeah. But it's really lovely because you you can, I imagine you you sort of all these different influences and, and disciplines that you can um take take sort of an influence from as mm. well as the photography mm. you know absolutely I and i think the, the the connection between photography and, and jewelry and silversmithing is fascinating the fact that, that photography is a, a silver-based process or analog photography is a silver-based process uh and absolutely. i believe there's research going on at the moment in uh, using a uh, spent fixer yes. uh, to, to silver plate objects so i think there's a real movement there of actually and i think that that interdisciplinary work is is very much in, in in the public eye at the moment i think i think a lot Absolutely. of artists do recognize the fact that there are different channels that you can express yourself through uh and i think that link between between uh yeah silversmithing and using light to influence silver is a fascinating subject yeah. which i haven't i've only really you know I hardly even scratched the surface myself but i think that there's a lot of a lot of mileage to get out of that definitely well, I do actually have um, some uh, fixer that I, I cut a sheet of copper in to um, send on to someone who was uh, going to sort of hopefully, I think, try and make some jewellery or some artwork with it. So uh, right. I haven't sent it to them yet. Maybe I'll send it to you instead. And... <laughs> oh, yeah, I'd love to have a play with that, definitely. But again, yeah. too, much, too much to do. <laughs> too much to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, your your photographic practice and i'm sure your other work as well but particularly um around your photographic practice now then um you're very keen that it is um environmentally sound mm. um and it, ha it 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 is is a sustainable practice um mm. what does that actually look like then for me i think it's a question of i think that we can't get around the fact that whenever we make anything we're using materials there's, mm -hmm. there's always going to be that that stumbling block because otherwise you know what do you do you, you end up doing nothing uh but i think that it's really important to me that uh, my, my, my partner my, well, she's my wife now we got married last week yay, yay. Uh, <laughs> she came up with the expression of making with meaning or it's, it's an expression that she uses a lot mm. and i think that yes when we're going to make things we have to consider the resources we're using uh, but also if we can make with some sort of purpose and some sort of message that's quite important because actually you're almost offsetting the material use by actually propagating a, an environmental message. Mm -hmm. So to me, what that means in the darkroom is, is that I'm uh, using homemade eco developers um, mm -hmm. made using various ingredients, uh, which I'm sure are freely available online. Um, so I've got a lot of caffeine based developers, vitamin mm -hmm. C, um, bicarbonate of soda, sodium carbonate. Uh, there's a fantastic recipe dished out by uh, General Tregan, uh, who's in South America. Uh, I can't remember exactly where, uh, but he actually uh, has a very good eco-developer recipe. Um, so for me, it's using using chemicals that are eco-friendly. I've got a lot of photographic chemicals that, that, are, that are left over that I've already bought. And I think, well, I've got to use them because I can't just throw them away. So my, my my intention from now on in is not to actually buy anything new when I make anything, if I can possibly avoid yes. it. A lot of my paper stock is is stuff that I've had for a few years now. Uh, so that already exists. Anything else is, is stuff. Quite often I'll get a phone call from somebody I know at the local dump and he'll say we've got a lot of photographic stuff in, so I'll whiz down there and pick it up. 
So oh, I'm jealous now. <laughs> oh, fabulous. No, he's great. A guy, a guy called Nick at the local dump. It's well worth knowing somebody at the dump. It really is. I've got a lot of dark room <laughs> kit, a lot of paper from there, definitely. Uh, and a lot of it is stuff that people wouldn't look at twice because it's got damp or it's got fogged. Mm. And I think, well, actually, that makes it more interesting to me. I think that yes. it's, it's still usable. Uh, so, yeah, anything I use, any materials I use, I try and make sure that they're, they're either secondhand or things that exist already or have an environmental... Um, ethos behind them i think it's very difficult to 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 i think a lot of people say oh analog photography it's not environmentally sound and i think that that's true i think that the practices we used to use back in the dark room when i did my work experience 35 yeah. years ago then yeah i think a lot of stuff was flushed down the sink and it was it was awful but i think that yeah. what we also have to consider is that the equipment that we use um i've got cameras that are 40 50 60 years old mm. that are still going strong now i don't think anyone can say that about digital equipment and i think that the notion of planned obsolescence in digital technology i think that there's an awful lot of carbon use that goes yeah. into actually people wanting to upgrade all the time so how, how rel relatively environmentally unsound analog photography actually is i'm, I'm unsure um but yeah I, I i think that there's also a question of uh standardization i think that digital photography is very um What's the word? It's 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 clinical and it, and it, and it's it, it, it's it's very it's it's kind of boring. I think it's dull because it's so standardised. Whereas I think if you use uh, the secondhand materials, secondhand cameras, there's always that element of chance. Yes. Uh, and I think that makes analog photography so much more exciting. Um, so yeah, I think that's answered your question. I could start rambling about all sorts of other things, but I'm sure we'll get onto other <laughs> stuff in a minute. Just um, you know, making a start within the industry looking mm. at digital looking at analog and how can we make it better how can we be more sustainable in our practices how can it mm. be less of a, a you know a potentially sort of a throwaway um culture so that mm. you know and, and and change happens when you start talking so i think it's um, mm. it, it's, it's certainly um worth considering all of those things we might uh, yeah. not have time <laughs> if, I, if i was being pedantic and those that know me well say so I'm, I'm good at it i think that yeah. you're right change happens when you start talking but i think actually the, the biggest changes happen when people start listening i think that that's that's yeah. crucial um because any silly fool can talk i'm one of them but actually i think it's, <laughs> it's, it's a question of yeah we've got two ears and one mouth for a reason I'm <laughs> <laughs> i love that <laughs> Well, talking of um, sort of analog um, interests, mm -hmm. I understand that uh, last year, obviously, we were all thrown into a very different scenario than what we were expecting. Mm. But I think you took that as an opportunity to to build yourself a, a dark room. It, did mm. that happen? Yeah, it did. Yeah, um, um, we're, well, we're we're very lucky uh, in 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 where we live and our location. Uh, we moved to East Devon uh, nearly three years ago now, uh, and we we know we knew that we wanted a, a property with some studios, mm. or without buildings that we could convert to studios, uh, which is what we've got. And they've been through various incarnations. So we know we've had jewellery studios. My my wife's a ceramicist, uh, so she she works down there as well. So yeah, I sectioned off an area of it for for my own dark room, which is an absolute lifetime's dream come true. I, I, I oh, did. Oh, it's wonderful. I did my work experience in the local paper when I was sixteen. Yeah. Uh, in the in the dark room and just always you know you know what it's like when you go into a dark room you just feel like yes. you you smell the fix and you put the safe light on and you're in your own little world it's just magic uh so yeah we i've got a dark room set up here which is lovely i've got a couple of old cranky enlargers which have a personality all of their own uh and <laughs> we're very lucky that we've got uh, a reasonable size garden that, that i've just got loads of ingredients to, to take down to the dark room and i call it plant torture i have to confess i call it torturing plants <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit sinister down there i think it's because it's dark and and you, you, there's that slightly obsessive <laughs> quality about what we do uh but i think there's an element because because i've uh, i'd say i left teaching in 2001 and I've uh, been self-employed, as I say, in various guises since then. And a lot of my time has been spent gardening for other people because that's a good way of bringing mm -hmm. money in while you're doing everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and I haven't, I, said I haven't enjoyed it that much. It wasn't really what I set out to do, but it's brought the money in. Uh, so in a way, I, 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 take, I take plants down to the dark room to torture them in revenge. It sounds really dodgy, <laughs> doesn't it? Because <laughs> it is. I don't really mean it. I love plants, but 
there's, there's, an, <laughs> there's an element of that. I think there's an element of taking something living. And and, and essentially what I'm doing is I, I am, I, I, I joke with my wife and I say, I'm going down to the studio to watch some plants die. <laughs> and it, it is that because I, I'm fascinated by, by, by the traces they leave behind as, as they rot. And I think that's, yes. that to me is something which I'm really fascinated by is that chemical interaction yes. between plants as, as they degrade and as, as they die and they start stinking. I, I grow my own flowers and I do chat to them like, you know, yep. lots of people do. But when I actually cut them, I apologise. And when right. they go back into the compost, yeah. um, there is that sort of, uh, yeah, and using them in photography. I fully get what, you, what, you, <laughs> what you're saying. Yeah, in a, I mean, in a very sort of absurd kind of Oh, uh, yeah. Way. I, I, don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't really feel like I'm doing that. I think I'd probably need some help if I did, wouldn't I? But <laughs> I, I think in a, in a way it's, it's, it's actually paying respect to, to what, what was a living thing and, it, and uh, yes. I think there's a karmic element to this and I'm not particularly of a religious persuasion but I think that mm. I think that you know we, we all every, every living thing goes through this process and I think that to actually pay something some respect as it's going through that process yeah. and, and to, to immortalize that in a way that's what we're all trying to do I think isn't it we're, we're all trying to immortalize moments in time and and, and, and processes I think that that's really important uh, so yeah, I think it, it is. It is. Um, what, what's this thing capable of now that it's it's outlived its mm. intended purpose, so to speak, of flowering? Uh, what can it now do, and what can it what can it leave behind? Uh, yeah, I think that's quite important to me. Is 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 uh, yeah, paying some respect to a living thing, definitely. And is that um, then part of or sort of the thinking behind um, a, a newish project that you're developing? developing i always try and avoid that word on this podcast because i always think it sounds like i'm trying to do some sort of photo pun but anyway some sort of photo <laughs> pun. yeah you get it fixed in your mind don't you yeah don't get me started on puns don't get me started on puns you can stop that, that right now <laughs> so, um yeah your project entitled horror hortus horror hortus yeah it's, it, it's, what it's what does that translate as actually then for uh, okay so uh just just have a 2000 years ago aristotle said that um nature abhors a vacuum uh, uh which which basically means that wherever there's a vacuum in nature then then nature will try and fill it with something mm. uh so a vacuum is, is an unnatural uh state of affairs uh and the greek for that was horror or vacui uh mm -hmm. which means nature abhors a vacuum uh, I can't claim that Horror Hortus was my invention. It was a guy called Michael Pollan who wrote a book called Second Nature. Okay. Uh, which is a wonderful, he's an American guy, uh, and he's written a book about, Second Nature is about gardening, but it's about gardening from an American's point of view, looking at the British approach to gardening, because American gardening and British oh, gardening wow. are two very different things. Uh, and basically he coined this term um, Horror Hortus, which means nature abhors a garden. Um, that's the translation of it. Uh, and actually, you know, when you think about it, gardens are one of the most unnatural things that we have. Um, yeah. Because if you just let a garden go, it doesn't do what you want it to do. It does what it feels like doing. Uh, yeah. I'm looking out the window right now and as is doing that as we speak. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, the, the idea of gardening to me is, is quite a it's quite a bizarre thing to do. It's, it's a, I think you can tell a lot about people from their gardens. I think you can tell a lot about how they treat other people and how they treat themselves, how they nurture. Um, there are people who like very regimented formal gardens and they tend to be very regimented formal people. Yeah. Uh, whereas to me, gardening is very much about listening to nature and listening to what it wants to do and just coercing it a little bit. So you get some sort of balance between your own desires and, and those of nature. Yeah. Um, so I think that what I'm trying to do with Horror Hortus and Horror Hortus comes in many different formats. Horror Hortus is an overarching project which has been going on for a while. Uh, and it's anything that I do photographically to do with plants. Uh, I've got various ideas of, I, I, I try and see it as, as part of the uh, Linnaean naming system, the binomial naming system for plants, well, all living okay. things, um, with the genus and species. Mm -hmm. So horror hortus is a bit like a genus, it's that overarching family of things that I'm doing. Okay. So the species can have various different forms, so there's, there's phytograms, there's lumen prints, uh, there's actual photographs of plants that I'm doing and again, watching them sort of decay uh, and actually documenting that process. Uh, I don't tend to take that many photographs anymore, unless uh, digitally I do, professionally, I try and do quite a bit of that. But mm. when it comes to actually using cameras, I do use cameras, but I tend to like using older cameras that are a bit more quirky. Um, and I also like the, 
the, the, the, the thing with um, analog cameras and some digital, you get that um, what you see through the viewfinder isn't exactly what you get. You've got yeah. that little little edge around the negs. And I'm really yeah. interested in, in those edges and, and what those edges do and the things that you don't see in the viewfinder that come out. Uh, I've, I've not I've not cropped an analog image for about 15, 16 years. I don't crop. Wow. Well, it's a way it's a way of selecting. I think that anything that, mm. that anything I've got on, on neg that I make a contact sheet of that I don't like, uh, unless I crop it, I don't print it because yeah. it's just a way of weeding stuff out. And I think it makes you look harder as well. I know we're verging on the different territory now, but uh, mm. so yeah, that, that's what Horror Horses is about. And I think it is just something which has various facets and, and will, will, will have various manifestations over a period of time for sure. And you've got within that, um, you, you, you're sort of looking like you say, you've got all these different um, elements to it. And there's one, I think, is it, um, I always say this wrong and I will sound like I'm very stupid, but hey ho, mm -hmm. um, the, is it Japanese poetry? The haiku. Well, haiku. haiku. Haiku, did yeah, I say yeah. it right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not Japanese, so actually I, I, you'd have to ask somebody, to, a native speaker to answer yeah. that. We probably all got it wrong. <laughs> Yeah, but hoping that we haven't. So you're 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 sort of combining words then with with that mm -hmm. work as well. Yeah, I think that, that there's there's a, an interesting correlation between between writing and photography. I think quite a lot of people who are what I would call real photographers, and take that as you will. Um, <laughs> I think that yeah, the the the, the 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 photography quite often has a narrative element to it. It has that that um, capacity to tell a story. Uh, and I think that it's quite interesting that you can tell a story with with pictures and with words and people mm -hmm. talk about painting pictures with words. So I think that those two things are quite interchangeable in, in terms of how, how you can use them. The, yeah. haiku that you, the haiku that you're talking about is, is um, it was a cherry tree that we have in the garden. Uh, and last March, I think it was, yeah, it was March, March, April. It was just flowering, but the, one of the branches was just hitting the fruit cage. It was just bending down onto the fruit cage. So it was going to poke through the fruit cage and render the fruit cage useless. So I thought, well, I've got to get rid of it. And I don't generally like cutting things off when they're in full flower. I think it's, mm. it's a bit cruel. So again, I thought, well, how do I, how do I pay respect to this? So I, I took it to the studio and put it in a vice and, and set, set up. I've got a Bronica uh, SQA. Uh, six by six so I set that up in front of it uh, and just recorded it every day exactly the same time uh, and just watched as the, as the uh, petals came off the flowers yeah they took a bit of encouragement at times it wasn't doing quite a, what I wanted to do it, it became apparent after about two weeks it became apparent that that I could probably get this to happen in 17 days now I don't know how much you know about the, the format of haiku but but the the, the very strict understanding of haiku and correct me forgive me if i'm wrong anybody who knows better than me because i'm sure there are a lot of people who know better than i do but i my understanding is that a haiku um traditionally is three lines and there are five syllables on the first line seven on the second and five on the third yeah. which is a set a total of 17 syllables um so i'd written this uh what i thought was a, a vaguely amusing haiku uh, which was want to write haiku, but 17 syllables is not enough to, <laughs> which I thought had a sort of Zen quality to it in my, in my silly little head. Um, so I thought that those two things would match up quite well because, because yeah. the cherry, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Japanese symbol, the, the cherry tree. Yes. Uh, so I thought that those two things might tie in quite well. And again, that, that, that element of watching something degrade and watching mm. something, um, <sighs> become less than it was in inverted commas but i think that actually celebrating what something becomes is very yeah. worthwhile i've actually still got because all the all the flowers fell off i've actually still got all the dried flowers all the buds i've got the old bits of twig i've kept them and at some point i'm going to do something with them yeah i'm probably going to burn them and do something with the ash but i'm not quite sure what yet oh, uh, fascinating no. well yeah. i do like thank you i, I do like the idea of things not being quite finished i, I, I quite yeah. like that 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 it's, it's quite a nebulous thing sometimes to actually say is that finished or not and you, you have a certain outcome from a project and you think well that's as far as it got as, as it's got right now but I always think there's potential for something to to further and develop yes. um, I do quite a lot of collage work and drawing work and quite often I've, I've taken images that I've made um, I, I've got a few on Instagram I, I've taken some of the images and I've framed them and then I've, I've got them out of frames and done more to them because I think actually it's not mm. quite finished yet 
so I do like that idea of things being in progress. Everything's kind of in transit, as we yes. all are. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes it's um, it's difficult at times. I, I and I think people who who you know people who work in art or artists, etc., can often struggle with knowing when something is mm. is finished. So actually, mm. being able to even if you feel yes that's it it's done but actually then if you if it if you feel actually no mm. that there's that desire that urge to to do more to do mm. to change then yeah it's um i really love that sort of like you say that sort of um ongoing element mm. um it doesn't have to be final mm. um, which is great but just coming back to the the sort of the, the marrying of words and pictures then uh, you did touch on it earlier and I would like to have a, a, a chat with you about it is you your your book allotted mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. now I love my allotment um, <laughs> and I'm not sure <laughs> I can't say I do all the work so I'm not <laughs> going to take all the glory for it but um what was the story with your your book around allotted time and how is that sort of allotment experience perhaps influence this work now that you're that you're you know you, where you're using the plants mm, that's a really good question I, I think that the allotment happened by accident it has to be said uh, <laughs> it was it was fundamentally it was back in 2002 a friend of mine and I uh, sat around having a beer one night uh, and we'd noticed we both had dogs and we'd walk past the local allotments and uh, we noticed that they were there and we said mm. well, should we should we give it a go and yeah we'll go on then you know, it's one of those ideas that you have after a couple of beers um, <laughs> so we got in touch and it was it was before there was a you know this long waiting list for allotments now and that, that wasn't the yeah. case then it was it was very much sort of uh, at the very sort of beginning of, of allotments uh, renaissance really um, mm. so we took it on and, and I, I was doing some writing at the time I would finished teaching uh, about, so about a year before I'd finished teaching uh, I wasn't in a great place um, in terms of mental health at the time mm -hmm. I was having quite a lot of issues and quite a lot of problems I was as I was actually off work mm. uh, and we took this thing on and it was a giggle and we enjoyed doing it mm -hmm. and it gave us a chance to build a shed and sit and drink tea and look at everything and do a bit of gardening once in a while uh, so I, I was writing a lot at the time. I had a notebook and it, I, I was keeping a notebook about the allotment. That's really how it started. Uh, and it kind of snowballed. Um, and it got to a point where I couldn't do the gardening without writing about it. And I couldn't really write about anything unless I was doing the garden. So it kind of <laughs> fed itself in a way. Um, yeah. And I wrote about, I ended up with about 100,000 words, loads and loads and loads of stuff um, and, and kind of forgot about it. I thought, wow, no one's going to be interested in that. I'm just some bloke with an allotment. And about a year later, I thought, well, I've written it now, so I might as well try it. So I sent it off and ended up getting published. Um, I had another one published a couple of years after that about fishing. I, I look back on them and, of course, I would like to recommend reading them. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> They're all right. They're, they're very much they're very much as they are. They're, they're not works of great literary merit. Um, they're a bloke who can string a few words together, writing about some plants and some fish. That's 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 really how I how I'd sell it. it but <laughs> I think in terms of there was definitely something there um, about the uh, mental health side of gardening. I think there's, there's yeah. certainly there's been a lot of research done into how gardening can be beneficial to mental health and i, I absolutely agree that there's a link yes. there for, for sure uh and i think you know it could be just something as fundamental as, as fresh air and exercise it could be yes it could be just that but i think there's something more to it than that i think there's something about fitting yourself into the cycles of nature and how nature happens and understanding that and understanding those cycles of of, of birth and death and everything that happens in between i think that yeah. actually gives you some sort of perspective on the world perhaps um but i think if from a photographic point of view now i think it's had a huge impact because i wouldn't have started gardening if i hadn't done that and while, while i was mm. doing the allotment i took on a couple of uh part-time clients uh, elderly ladies who were absolutely delightful i knew very little about gardening at the time uh and they taught me huge amounts because they, they, they had the knowledge but they didn't have the physicality to actually do the gardening so i went along i was you know in my early 30s at the time so i was still fairly fit and strong so i could do all the the, the grunt work for them and they could actually give me information so i just was like a sponge just taking all this information yeah. on board and 20 years later i i i, I think you 
you, you gain experience through doing. You know, I certainly yeah. gain experience and learning through doing. And I think that I've learned an awful lot about plants and gardening. Uh, there's still so much to learn, but I think that that stood me in good stead. And I think it's, it's given me uh, a grounding in, in what gardens are about, what plants are about, how they work, uh, what's important about them. And I think that it links you into the ecosystem as well. Yeah. Uh, I think understanding plants gives you an understanding of, of how important absolutely everything is in, in that system and how fragile it is. And, uh, yeah. and that's, you know, that's the centre of what we're talking about today, isn't it? Um, about, you know, how, how do we make our practice as artists, whatever we do, how do we make that more sustainable? How do we, how do we propagate that? How do we disseminate it? How do we, how do we get that message to other people? Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just think it really does um, paint that that picture of how, you, like you just said, things are, are interlinked and it's no mm. different, um, you know, it, it, in all of our different lives that we lead, that mm. fundamental element of um, ecosystems and, and being connected. And I, I think, uh, you know, listening to you, there's, there's that element as well of, this can with with um the earth with um other plants other species mm. as, as well you know there's mm. a sense almost um i always and i certainly personally find a joy in that as well which i mm. think you know ties back to the sort of helping with uh, with sort of mental health um, mm. but you do have um and you can correct me if if i'm wrong um and I might have to bleep one of these words, <laughs> but I think you've actually got another project um, in the pipeline, um, whether you've started it or not, which is actually um, going to be portrait based. So, as oh, you're talking about the, salt shed and silver. That's the one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's important that we don't bleep that word. No, no, we're all adults here. <laughs> well, exactly, and I think I think also. What, what, what that's about, and it's, it's, it's very much uh, an incipient project, it's not something I've actually, well, I've made a start on the technicalities of it, but it's not something which I've actually made a start on uh, physically yet, um, okay. largely due, due to timing and funding issues. Um, mm. Basically, it's, it's, I've, I've, been a, I've been involved in, in using the sea uh, for recreation since I was 16. Mm. Well, earlier than that, I've, I've, been, I've loved the sea since I was a kid uh my, my passion for the sea is as old as my passion for photography perhaps even older mm. uh and i think that that i think it's just iniquitous that we still live in a country that, that is having raw sewage discharged into its rivers and oceans i mm. think it's how do we how do we justify that i have no i just think it's mind-boggling that we that, that people can justify that so if the word shit offends anybody then then <laughs> write to your mp don't get in touch with me because actually if Yay. people weren't people weren't mm -hmm. dumping that in the oceans and I wouldn't be saying it. Um, and I thought about when, you know, when, I, when I'm thinking about perhaps getting this off the ground and publicizing it, uh, I've been tempted by using asterisks, but I'm not going to, I think actually it's really important that, that sometimes people need a, a bit of a shock. And I mm. think just using a, a word that people are going to have a reaction to then at least it's a reaction, at least it gets them involved. The idea. Yeah, the, the, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, mind you, I mean, you can't wake a sleeper, can you? That's the problem. <laughs> uh, but the idea. But behind, we can try. Yeah, we can try. Absolutely. And I think that sometimes people need a shock. And yeah, salt, shit and silver is, is about those three things. It, it's, it's about salt, water. It's about um, excrement. It's about effluent. Uh, and it's about silver uh, and using the salt printing process. Um, mm -hmm. What I want to do is is make portraits of people who have been uh, who've been made ill by surfing or by using the water yeah. for recreational purposes. So anybody, I had dysentery in nineteen ninety one. Okay. Um, yeah, I was, I was I was canoeing on the River Torridge, uh, and okay. I, I contracted dysentery. So it's quite a it's quite a personal thing for this me. And I, I've been ill okay. various other occasions as well. I mean, there's there's all sorts of throat infections people get from swimming in salt water, and it's just terrible. Um, mm. And I think to highlight that, so I'd like to take portraits of, or sorry, make portraits of people who who've been affected by this, and then develop those uh, develop that film and the paper in the water that they were made ill by yeah. so using the contaminants and again it goes back to that 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 um notion that analog photography is, is, a, is a slightly random process that has different outcomes every time you do it uh and i'd quite like to explore the idea of of 
printing, um, developing and printing images using contaminated water. Yeah. But also doing one using non-contaminated water to show people the difference. Um, so I think that there's, that, that I've had this idea for ages, it's been the last two or three years and I still haven't got it off the ground, which is frustrating, but there's just only there's so many hours in the day. I just need three or four of me, to be honest. There's not, there's not enough yeah. to go around. This is really is a great, a, a great um, idea for, you know, for trying to um, highlight an issue. I, I, I really hope it does, it does happen. Thank you. And yeah. I, I definitely think it will. I, I, I mean, again, I think it's a question of reaching out to other people and, and trying to get some help with it in a way. Yeah. Uh, I've applied for, for various to various people for funding for it and not, not actually got anywhere with it so far, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but I'm pretty sure that the, the SAS in your hometown uh, would be quite interested yeah. in, in helping out with that for sure. I mean, it's, it's obviously uh, an issue that's, that's at the core of what they do. Um, so, yeah, any, anybody out there who isn't who isn't contributing towards the SAS campaign, then do it. It's, it's, I just no... tag them in. Please do. This. And it, it does tie into a question that I like to ask everybody who, who takes part in the podcast. And that's really, um, it's quite a, a, a wide uh, question. So it's really how it relates to you and your practice in, in particular. Mm. Um, but how do you think photography can actually have an influence on environmental thinking or prompting action on environmental issues then it's a very good question um i think it's very difficult these days uh to to be a maker of images especially photographic images i think that the world is so saturated with them we have mm. so many of them that i think that part of the battle that we face is actually doing anything that, that makes people sit up and listen in the first place mm. um so i think in a way it's a bit of an uphill struggle um, but having said that, I think that if we can produce, I think fundamentally, what as artists, as, as creators of any sort, I think that the goal uh, is to produce things that entertain, uh, and, and whether that entertainment is is um, pleasurable or not is is perhaps mm. open to, to question. I, I, I talked to somebody once. I, I've always had this question. Are you part of the audience or are you part of the, the, the play? And I've always been part of the audience. I've always been somebody who watches. I've always been somebody who, who looks at stuff going on and not necessarily making any judgment, judgments about it, but actually just I always observe. That's always what I've yeah. been up to. And I think that, that um, it's really important as creatives to entertain and to be entertained. And I think that sometimes people think, oh, to be entertained means made to laugh or made to enjoy yeah. oneself. But actually, entertainment can take on all sorts of different formats. Some people watch horror films. I'm not into them myself. But some people get entertained by watching really quite distressing, disturbing mm. stuff. Now, I don't, I don't particularly find that entertaining. But I think that, that that value of entertainment and the value of being engaged by something. So I think that we, first of all, we have to make work that engages people. And I think that quite often people want to look at something pretty. I think there's an element of wanting to make things that are visually attractive. Mm. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be pretty, but it, I think something that engages, that stops people in their tracks. Yeah. I think that the power of making images is, 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 has been undermined by digital technology because we're surrounded by them. I remember, um, I am going off track, but honestly, it'll make sense in a minute. Uh, <laughs> I did it back in 2000 and something, 2000 and... 11 I think it was uh, I did a, um, a darkroom course just alternative processes lots of different alternative processes mm. and one of them was making pinhole cameras out of a matchbox yes uh, which is fab I, I've actually developed a, a 120 version um, so the, the 35 mil is quite easy to make because you, you just use a normal size matchbox and you feed the film mm -hmm. through it a bit of insulation tape and you're away uh, and I made one of these uh, 10 years ago and we're in the dark room and there's a bunch of other people and everybody else had done a bit of it but i really got into it and I, I produced a print a pinhole print and there were three or four people standing around me going wow it's a pinhole photograph wow that's amazing and i just i thought at the time that's quite ironic because people spend thousands of pounds on camera kit and everybody everybody goes yeah whatever but you get a matchbox and you make a pinhole print people are interested so i think that it's contingent on us as, as, as artists to, to continually find ways of 
making images or making objects that that stop people that that make people look and make people want to find out more mm. um because i think behind that attractive or pretty or engaging piece of work there has to be something behind it to hold people's interests it's not about producing yeah. more stuff it's about producing something that arrests people and makes people ask the question what is that and why is that and i think that that why is how we it, it, getting people to that why is really important and it's not easy um especially yeah in an image saturated world it's not easy but yeah. i think that the 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 way that images are made and the way that artwork is made is of primary importance because yeah like i said at the beginning of the conversation if we if we don't make things that have any meaning then we are just we're making tap uh and that's just using it resources for no apparent reason and i can't have that so yeah that that message has to be out there i think it's very difficult i think yeah it's a difficult thing to do but it's not impossible but again i think that you have to start with yourself in a way you have to start with things that interest you mm. as, as a maker and and uh, engage you and, and and make you want to do more of it and if you want to do more of it then hopefully people want to see more of it yes and i think um you using that it, that that those few words uh, making with meaning it really does um convey what you're trying to do with with mm. the practice mm. as well <clears throat> yeah um, and live, you know, sort of living our, our lives in, in general, if we can do it with, with sort of a, yeah, a purpose sure. or some, or some thought. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think it is that sort of thing. And yeah, it's, it's, it's about, it's about being thoughtful and, 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 you know, a common, a common word at the moment is mindful. And I think that, that mm -hmm. there is that, that element of kind of clicking out in a way. And I think that that meditative, meditative quality of making art and the best art, I think is meditative when you look at it as well um that really does make you stop and actually forget about everything else and i think that's what the dark room does for me is is that you're surrounded by not a lot in the dark room really you you, you are very limited and you're, you're kind of stuck in there and i think that that does lead to a sort of mindful creative process and if, if that can get translated through the work that i produce then so much the better that, that's 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 a bonus really brilliant so if people um want to take a look at your work and find out more about you you reckon they will for me banging um, on like this <laughs> <laughs> no they definitely will um, <laughs> flattered, flattered um, if they did <laughs> where can they find you uh, do you what's your website details and any social media yeah so my, my website is uh, robinsheltonphotography.com uh, mostly I, I, I work as a, a professional, well, professional photographer. I work as a photographer, um, making images for galleries and, and other, other artists. Uh, it's something which is in high, well, high demand at the moment. Um, so I, that, that's what I focus on, but there is the section, there's the horror horses, uh, section on the website. If people are interested in looking at that, um, my Instagram, uh, my professional Instagram handle is Robin Shelton photography at Robin Shelton photography. But I've also got a personal account, which is um, at underscore Yabit, Y-A-B-B-I-T underscore. Uh, and that documents the um, watching plants die work that I do. Fantastic. <laughs> the, the, the plant graveyard. The, the plant graveyard. Yeah, those, those we have loved. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's there's there's quite some something very poetic in that, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I hope so. I, we we all we all try, don't we? We all try. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I've really enjoyed chatting with you, and I I know it. We could talk uh, about many more things for a lot longer. Um, well, and no, I'm sure, no doubt, at some um, point we will. Yeah, and it'd be lovely to sort of keep in touch and do let me know if you, um, you know, if you um, get to started on the salt, shit and silver project. That, sure would be, that would be brilliant. But yeah, a huge thank you, Robin, for, for chatting with me. It's Not been at all. brilliant. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, Josie. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening in. As Robin said, find him at robinsheltonphotography.com and on Instagram at robinsheltonphotography or at underscore yabbit underscore. I know you won't be disappointed taking a look at his work. 
And if you'd like to get in touch with me and let me know about your eco-conscious photography and maybe take part in the podcast, head over to my website, josiepurcellphotography.com. See you next time. Hello everybody, welcome to the Photopocene podcast, it's really lovely to have you here again. This week I'm really excited to be joined by a photographer who is looking at making work with bioplastic and cyanotype and she has created some amazing work with this. We also chat about her other projects as well. And it's really, really interesting to hear more from this photographer all about her interest in sustainable photography, alternative processes and all her plans for the future. And that photographer is Martha Gray. So do keep on listening in and find out more about this fascinating photographic artist and all of her works. Enjoy! So it's always an honour to chat to photographic artists and this episode's guest is no exception. So welcome very much to Martha. Hello, Martha. Hiya. Thank you for having me. It's really lovely to have you here. Um, and I'm really pleased that you've been able to join us. I think a lot of people listening in will be really excited to learn more about your, your work. Uh, just to give people um, a flavour of, of your your practice, your photographic practice, exploring the personal relationship to the natural, and that's through a variety of experimental photographic processes. Can you expand on that a little bit more and, and just um, tell us how you became interested in photography, got involved, and how that sort of led to, to that interest um, and way of working? Um, well, I think I've always had a really strong uh, fascination with the natural world, and particularly as a child, and I was really obsessed with watching wildlife documentaries and things like that, which mm -hmm. are very much a sort of photographic medium in a sense, and I think that's kind of where I first started getting interested in it. Um, and then I sort of struggled at school with sciences, but kind of did really well creatively. And then mm -hmm. photography was kind of the merging of the two, mm. um, particularly like analog photography. Where I wasn't fully aware of that at the time because I started doing it when I was around 13. Yeah. But I kind of had that epiphany when I was in my first year of uni and I discovered the world of art and science is an interdisciplinary medium yeah um and that's kind of where the personal comes in I feel like I can't help but talk about or try to explore my fascination with the natural world through creating my work and when I was doing my BA um, I had a lot of health issues in relation to taking too many antibiotics okay. and I was creating a lot of work around the idea of like my body being an ecosystem which it is and that's kind of also how I got into the idea of it being a personal relation to the natural world like a personal yeah okay and is um is that sort of one of the projects that you that sort of looks at then the the body um and its relation is um is that called orbit is that the one that you've that you've sort of um linking um i guess the human body with with uh, mental health is that am i right i mean do, please do um correct me and, and and just tell me perhaps a bit of more about that one then so it is part of that general like theme that I was running on but it started with the CVH series okay which was which stands for cyanotype vinegar and honey and um 
uh, vinegar and honey are both foods that are high FODMAPs, which are foods that are irritants to the gut. And mm -hmm. with the over prescription of antibiotics, my, I don't know, I just one day I woke up and I just couldn't eat anything anymore. Like my body. Oh my just, goodness. Like, no, I just done too many. Um, and so I had to go on the FODMAP diet. Um, mm. And I decided to try and make work using the experience that I was having. So it wasn't a, didn't feel like a completely pointless and bad experience, which is where yeah. the sort of mental health aspect comes into it. Um, and I started photographing the, I started applying the vinegar and the honey as like a chemigram onto cyanotype when it coated on paper, but wasn't wet. Mm. No, sorry, it wasn't dry. So when it was still wet and then yeah, I would expose it and then take macro shots and then okay I the orbit is um microscopic images with the same uh chemicals so cyanotype vinegar and honey but on acetate and okay it has a bit more of a planetary spacey absolutely aesthetic so then that came into the notion of like cosmos and it so, almost looks when i look at those ones i'm actually looking at those now um on your website um it almost looks as though the the circular sort of elements are are actually potentially look like mercury almost oh right they, okay That's they have that slight <laughs> they have that slight metallic feel in in, yeah. in a way they're very, very beautiful. That um, is work that you've been creating um, in between your BA, is, is that right? And then you've gone on to do an MA or is this yeah. sort of a, yeah. So CVH was for my BA and then the orbit was, I had one year between my BA and my MA and that was mm -hmm. during that year. And then, yeah, my MA has been my more recent stuff. And it's uh, quite exciting because you've just finished your MA and your MA was the Arts and Science Masters at Central St. Martins. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you um, in a little bit um, more detail about um, the series of work that you've particularly concentrated on um, during that. Um, but we'll come back to that shortly um, because what I'd also like to do is just really have a, a chat with you um, about some of your other previous work and, and one that caught my eye was an exhibition um, which is relates to sort of the uh, Roman numerals and you, you you did this as part of the Lumen Crypt residency yeah um, and I'm quite intrigued by it um, simply well mainly because I love the, the, the subject and what you've done um, but also because my mum's family came from Italy and there's a, a link to Italy there. Um, can you just explain to people in a little bit more detail what this project actually was um, and how it how it worked? So um, the, the Collective Lumen, they have this uh, gallery space, which is in the crypt of Bethnal Green Church. Mm -hmm. And they uh, approached me and two other artists, which is Melissa and Ludo, mm -hmm. if to do a collaborative month long residency, like a site specific one. Mm -hmm. But Ludo was going home to Italy for a, a large part of it. So we decided to try and incorporate that into the residency. And we realized that what tied us all together was that we were all seeing the same sky no, no matter where yeah. we were and we thought that was quite a nice sentiment considering that like we were meeting for the first time and we were connecting and the sky was what was sort of it's like the central the thing, it? yeah it was yeah. kind of signified that connection even though you can be strangers but there's always still yeah the sky so we um would do these 
FaceTime to keep it site specific we'd do these FaceTimes and it would be like one of us would be so two of us were in London so one of us would be at the crypt and then one of us would be at home and then Luda would be in Italy and we'd all Mm -hmm. just take a bunch of random photos of this guy (laughs) (laughs) with our 35 mil at the same time and then when Ludo came back we got them developed and we did a bunch of workshops together in the in the space so I did cyanotype and then Melissa did a zine no Melissa did screen printing and then Ludo did a zine one and then the accumulation of the work that we produced was the exhibition and it was a really fun experience I really enjoyed it it looks it it does look I really love it I'm 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 really intrigued by it and I I do love that sort of um that play on um sort of how you've worked out the sort of locality and the the extremes of a line there's a little bit of mathematics in there and um yeah (laughs) but I I do really really love that one and it's really like, like you say sort of having get that finding a link with another person or other people um is uh, just sort of yeah a, a really beautiful sentiment now you've done some other exhibitions as well and another one i think is another collaboration um and this one is an exhibition that actually was then shown in um a hospital setting now oh, yeah. <laughs> in in my past i i did have i well twice actually in the past i've worked as a photographer and um yeah, I'm always. Um, I always think hospitals are a great opportunity for artists to be able to share their work. You know, especially one to help patients. Two, if you're sat waiting and you want something interesting to think about, and you know, different reasons. But how did that one come about then? How did you end up in the? Was it the um, Nuffield Hospital? started at Nuffield and then it moved to a second location which is I'm trying to remember oh yeah and then it moved to Churchill Hospital which are both in Oxford um okay. and it ran for a few months um so basically uh Natasha she wanted to put on this exhibition and she found this amazing space in Nuffield Hospital mm. But she wanted to collaborate with people who had an element of medical issues within mm-hmm. their work to kind of fit the theme. And so it was me and uh, Jill that she ended up contacting. And Jill's work was a lot to do with her experience of cancer. And then mine okay. was to do with my experience of the a prescription of antibiotics and like subsequent yeah. gut health issues the cvh things so we then put out an open call on the theme of cosmos um to explore our placement within the natural world and the macro and micro micro in the outer space and the human body sort of being similar yet very distant environments Mm. um there's a lot of influence from i can't remember his name he's a theorist i can't remember anyway if we think of it we'll uh, put it in the (laughs) podcast notes (laughs) yeah but it was a really it was a brand new experience for me putting on something on that scale Mm. which involved you know traveling and everything like that and yeah, and, and how do you sort of feel? Because obviously when you're working with these processes, um, the the sort of inside of the body, the natural to the outside, um, you, you do sort of work across both, don't you? And we'll talk about sort of the new work that you've um, started. Um, and this is around your um, using bioplastics and cyanotype. Yeah. For me personally, um, cyanotype is is one of my my loves um so this is uh just a really fascinating sort of evolving i guess <laughs> um of the cyanotype process so yeah what can you tell us about it i think it's like so because i created this in the pandemic it's been really hard to describe it <laughs> <laughs> and photograph it and explain it. It, it and there was an element of they're three-dimensional objects but they can 
really mostly be seen by people as two-dimensional objects so it is mm -hmm. quite important to explain the process behind it but I basically I, I was a participant on the sustainable darkroom residency the London Alternative Collective one which is where okay. I started doing this um, and I and the same as you, I basically love cyanotype. I'm not really sure why. I just <laughs> keep going back to it. I just, I don't know. Apparently um, blue is meant to be one of the most loved colour in, in the world. Apparently I read somewhere once. So maybe that is, the sim that's simply it. We just... Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just the most fascinating colour to me because it doesn't really exist naturally that mm. often. And, you know, like things like the sky or like the blue in the eyes it's kind of more of a reaction to light than yes and so it's like a really synthetic uh color that it makes but you, it gives the impression of being like a really natural color of the mm. but, um yeah I, I i i want i like the idea of trying to create a cyanotype that used less paper so mm. i was influenced by glass cyanotypes and uh polaroid emulsionless yes and i didn't want to use gelatin because there's mm -hmm. obviously like a lot of gelatin in yeah. analog and alternative photography so it's kind of combining those two things um yeah. and then it's been basically a really long process of trial and error with a lot of like happy accidents along yeah. the way I didn't expect them to become their own um, like three dimensional object. I kind of thought they would have to be on on a like attached and printed onto a paper. But then one day yeah. I walked away from one, one and I come back and it lifted itself off. And yeah. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so it's a combination of agar, which is derived from red algae, uh, water, and cornstarch, and then cyanotype and I basically use a method very similar to creating a glass cyanotype, mm -hmm. but I then at the end remove it from the glass and have a drying system that allows it to be able to just exist on its own form. So it's 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 almost like um, a sculptural yeah. photography. It sort of sits. I've had people sort of. I feel like people don't really know if they think it is photography yeah. <laughs> it sort of sits between sculpture and photography and because I haven't really been able to show people them that much outside of online I don't really know how I feel about that yet yeah as well do you do you do you feel then that people it, it will you know as you can start showing this work perhaps um in person that that will potentially change how people react to it then I mean I think I haven't yeah I, I haven't really seen people react to it I've, I've had one exhibition which was my MA degree show but mm -hmm. otherwise it's been completely online um but I, I'd quite like to I'm, I'm trying to produce a sort of zine type book which is a kind of a tongue-in-cheek take on scientific uh, studies from like the 18th century okay treating them as specimens but also have a guide on how to do the process so that I can share it and people can create their own okay as well. that's that's fantastic I will definitely keep an eye out for that one <laughs> yeah. I haven't I, I wasn't sort of constrained by the rules of making bioplastic and trying to oh. produce what would be considered like a good bioplastic i was just yeah. sort of making weird agar prints <laughs> um and so they they have a a different texture so like a bioplastic can tends to be quite like a hard material or it can be softer but but these are quite thin and flexible they're, they're more like a print in a way but um i'm mm. I have a habit of photographing everything very neurotically because I'm really bad at taking like notes. <laughs> so I have lots of photos which kind of 
I can put into a blog online and that will kind of trigger a memory of what I was doing but yeah I am really impatient when it comes to these things <laughs> so it has been quite an inconsistent like process um but that means that I then get to experiment with a lot of different variations and recipe and like that is what makes it that that is what I love about photography and working with alternative processes and art in general is being able yeah. to make something completely from scratch and I really enjoy transforming the cyanotype into a contemporary process sort of like reimagining mm. it as beyond the constraints of like the historical narrative that it has so it's I think uh, Anna Atkins would would love what you what you've done with it. I definitely do. I mean, you know, her her and her, obviously she had less opportunity, but obviously at the time, but with her father and um, you know, sort of being involved in the the science scene of the day, and uh, you know, I can imagine that this um, this work would be they they would definitely be wanting to find out more themselves. So and so, I really think um, it's a really good nod to Anna but very much like you say um a, a new take on it and a new way of seeing it as well which is which is great and although I do love a cyanotype fern I've not seen any of these with a fern on us yet which is yeah, a, so... a nice change <laughs> yeah I mean I ended up writing my whole dissertation about Anna Atkins and sort of like the canon of the history of photography and there's been a very conscious choice to avoid any botanical printing in it yes I feel like with Anna Atkins there's been a particular unique uh, kind of like kitsch commercialization of her work which is related back to that seeing the mm. woman's work as less than and I wanted to kind of create like an autonomous image that rejects that notion of being restricted by a narrative that has been presented to me as a woman in photography that I don't necessarily like believe or buy I don't know if that makes sense yeah no it does it does make sense it, it really does completely make sense I mean exactly as you've just said you know back in sort of 1840s um, and 50s time you know this this might have been uh, more acceptable sort of the botanical art was an acceptable thing yeah. for, you know so if there was a bit of science around the botany um you know yeah so so pushing against that um and certainly in this way that you're doing I think really does um yeah so it, it's something that I'm starting to visit with it now I just didn't want to do it for the MA um because I sort of feel like for me the photogram is sort of like the most autonomous image because it has mm. the most control over how much of it is depicted it gets to touch the surface of the photosensitive material and it its shape then and like transparency then de decides how much of it is seen and I was reading a lot of Susan Sontag and how she talks about the how we assume truth from an image even though it's not necessarily the truth and which is like relevant today in contemporary culture, where it's like we we know the images aren't real, but we still can't help but see them yeah. as real. And the language that she wrote that she was saying was around photography that I hadn't realized, where it's like to shoot and to capture and to take, and it's all very aggressive. Yes. Like I really want to do more work with photograms, but for this particular, you've obviously just finished your MA with this as your as your sort of main focus. So do you think you've you've um it will sort of keep evolving then or have you got something that you've just touched on making uh perhaps making photograms of what what sort of are you thinking of doing next then so i i want to keep working with the bioplastics i think it's i really love the process and i want to share it and exhibit it more but i want to potentially create more photograms with that process because i haven't really shown that it can print quite well in a very literal sense because I've been doing quite abstract stuff um, mm -hmm. and there is obviously the element of sustainability within that I think it's like there's a whole sort of movement going on within photography and particularly alternative photography towards creating more sustainable 
uh, practices and I think that for me that's potentially the pathway that this is going I see the like plastic is a product of the industrial revolution and it's like a completely Mm. disposable thing and then cyanotype as a process it was completely came into existence because of the industrial revolution and it's so connected to industry as a process you know things like Mm. blueprints and things like that but combining the two as like a bioplastic cyanotype to create a completely sort of opposite like precious and more environmentally friendly the sort of rejection of the industrial roots of photography I think is something really interesting that I want to pursue and I see loads of people doing that as well like it's really easy to just accept that there is a lot of waste in animal photography because that's just how it is you know yes but I think I see so many people working to change that yeah it's been brilliant it the, the last sort of um few years in particular I think it's it's really started to take off um you know this interest in um looking at sort of um what are the alternatives uh you know particularly like you say around is around gelatin and it'll be interesting I think in the future if um research can be done with you know the perhaps a larger photographic companies say you know what is there any sort of research that can be actually done to sort of look at how can this be done on a larger scale because analog um, and alternative photography um i think obviously when digital came in it had its its low but it's never gone away and i do mm. think it's 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 certainly um interesting it um from what i've seen is it's, it's been growing so if it is growing are, are there ways to like you've said make it more sustainable but perhaps um you know we we might not be able to get rid of all the chemicals that people would need to use to print in certain ways but there's whole conversations there then isn't there about well yeah you know sort of that balancing act between creating work and what you use to create that work i mean i definitely think that it, it will i think it's quite a powerful statement for people working in this medium where it's like the nature of it is to be as like chemical and to use those water and paper Mm. and be all about consumption to completely change that I think it's Mm. yeah I think it's a really powerful statement and I think like it will definitely be picked up by institutions and continue on to companies and things like that I really do think so fingers crossed um but what you've actually now you're now also doing martha is i believe you're now editing um alternative processes as well um is that is that quite a new role then for you is that recent yes so uh it's shiara she runs it and um she's in spain i believe Mm -hmm. um and then there's Ella as well. I can't remember what Ella is, but it's it's. She took me and Ella on recently, and it's was sort of when I was just finishing my MA, so I haven't really managed to get into it too much. But and also with the pandemic, it's a bit. Mm. We're trying to figure out what to do, but the idea is to create a platform, or to to expand on the platform and create something that is educational and accessible and. Mm-hmm then can support artists in the long run and hopefully be able to put on exhibitions and things like that. It's a bit tricky right now, but Mm. we're mostly focusing on, well, the photo objects just been uh, released. It's just gone live, which was curated by uh, Cheryl, which is a really interesting topic. And then um, Ella's just had her in her printing with mud with Lucas Leffler interview and I've got one coming with Melanie King it should be at the end of this month about how to print using plants using seaweed printing Fantastic. with spinach and developing with seaweed so I'm really excited about it yeah it's gonna be a good thing I think yeah I look forward to to sort of finding out more and um yeah I just I just love hearing sort of what people are up to and 
um, and sort of all the all the different ideas and and sort of all the different outputs as well. It's um, it's it's good for the soul to to be able to yeah, see it all. Uh, it's all um, about the community. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. Now, I always like to ask um people who have a chat with me on the podcast um how you think photography then as a as a tool um can actually influence um environmental thinking whether that's in relation to our impact um on on the world or if it's in relation to um highlighting perhaps uh human-centered issues uh, okay, I need to think about this one. Yeah, it's a big question, really, yeah. isn't it? Because <laughs> it no is. Pressure. Well, it is on that sentiment that I think it, like, back to what I said earlier, like, I think it's pretty poignant that in a medium where industry has been its narrative to be mm. rejecting that is quite a statement within the art world. And then these things have to start off small and build up mm. you know I when I was doing my my BA dissertation was I wrote about the question was if art can be a good tool for communicating climate change and mm. the answer was sort of maybe because <laughs> it's like <laughs> we have to somehow try and make unrelatable and seemingly distant scenarios tangible and mm. there are examples of large-scale artworks like Olaf Olarsson's Time Watch and things which do do that but the general feel is that the small-scale grassroots mm. operations that build up tend to be the ones that create the most impact but hopefully if we can you know the the power is in the in the big corporations and things like that so it's like hopefully our voices can be heard and make a difference yeah. um being heard i think isn't it like you've just said it's um hoping that other people will then uh, be intrigued by what you're doing i think and and i know looking at your work um then people will be <laughs> if they see it so yeah, they... cuz it's like sustainability is really hard you know, it's a really hard thing to do and it's like um, really difficult as an individual to sort of feel that weight completely on you and mm. try to change how you live but then feel frustrated at the limitations of that because of the sort mm. of society we live in. So, Yes, I think you I... have to take a moment to be kind to yourself, don't you? So you've obviously finished your MA um I imagine um that um that's sort of a a, a big sigh of uh <laughs> relief now it's all done um do you know when you when do you find out about the sort of outcome of that have you are you all or you all sort of got your results etc are you still in oh, that phase? yeah no I've got my results and everything. but yeah no it's all finished now but it, it was a really great experience I really really enjoyed it um, fantastic and thankfully the pandemic kind of allowed me to get really really into something rather than yeah take me away from something I, I I imagine if you could go back in time without the pandemic how and sort of do it again and yeah just sort of it'd be really interesting almost to see how different it would have actually been so yeah I mean I because the sustainable darkroom residency was supposed to be in a dark room but then the pan we went into lockdown so it got switched to being at home and i yeah. probably wouldn't have started working with bioplastic if i didn't have to figure out something to do in my own kitchen brilliant yeah. i love yeah it's almost the equivalent of a, a, these great ideas on beer mats in the pub yeah it's <laughs> been a real domino effect scenario for me it is it's i love it it's a fantastic work and i um, i'm really looking forward to um what you're going to do next um do you have any plans uh, for what's happening next or are you just having a bit of a rest now the ma's done yeah i'm in a sort of it's a bit of an awkward transitional period right because it's uh, post ma but also still with the pandemic and everything but mm. 
I'm really happy to have this uh, to be part of the alternative processes team and I mm. want to focus on that and sort of projects with that and I'm figuring out this book that I want to release as well um, and just keep sort of developing the biosphere and work mm. more because that is really what I'm passionate about right now and Mm. yeah keep applying for things really yes yeah well good luck with all of that um if people want to find out more about your work um and the things we've spoken about or you know i know that there's more things that you've you've, you've done and you'll, you'll get up to so where is it people can can see your work find out more about you what are the best places for them perhaps online to go yeah, so I'm most active on Instagram, which is um, m.e.a.gray, but that's gray with an A as well. That's my handle. Um, and then I have my website as well, which is Martha Gray, I think PB Photography, it's like dot PB, but that's linked to my Instagram. Um, Brilliant. And I'll definitely put those links in the in the podcast info for you as well, so we can um, hopefully get some people finding out about you if they don't already know about you that that'll help them <laughs> find out about you um but i want to say a big huge thank you um i am really really intrigued about your bioscience thing and i'll um really looking forward to seeing um what you get up to with with that um as well as your your other work um so a huge thank you martha for taking part um i've really enjoyed it and i hope you have too yeah, no, it's so nice to talk about work with people who don't get that opportunity that much anymore. But yeah, thank you so much for having me on. No problem at all, Martha. Thank you. Thanks. I loved finding out more about Martha's work and um, I hope you'll head on over to her website and social media. As she mentioned, you can find her on Instagram at m.e.a.gray and that's grey with an A and her website is marthagray.pb.photography so do please go take a look at her work. The BioCyan project, I'm really keen to learn more about that and see what happens in the future as well. And if you're working in a sustainable way or your photographic practice or interest relates to the environment or the human impact on nature, then do please get in touch with me. I'd love to hear your photographic story too. Go over to josiepurcellphotography.com and send me a message and we can hopefully catch up and find out more and maybe make a chat for the podcast. I hope to see you next time. Bye. Hello everybody. I hope you're all doing well. I took a little break recently for just a few weeks and took a little holiday, but back now on the Photopocene podcast. And I'm so pleased that this time I am joined by an interdisciplinary researcher and someone who says that she isn't a photographer, but she is indeed very creative and use photography as part of her most recent project. And that is Steffi De Gattano. It's an absolutely fascinating conversation about the um, technique she's decided to use to share her story that relates to um, the life of a river and much more. So do please carry on listening in and hear from her about this project and where you can actually find out more. But obviously I'll put all the details in the text as well. But yeah, I had a great time chatting with Steffi and I hope you really enjoy listening in too. So this time on the Photopocene podcast, I'm joined by interdisciplinary researcher and artist, Steffi De Gattano. 
So please, Steffi, a big welcome, but please do um, ap uh, huge apologies for my pronunciation of your surname there. Oh, it was perfect. De Gaetano sounds yeah, very good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> no, absolute pleasure to, to be chatting with you. Now, having looked at your work and what you do, you, you describe your aim as um, critically unbuilding the fields of architecture, anthropology and photography by uncovering colonial entanglements. I have to just say that's one of my favourite words. <laughs> um, and the ramifications of modernity. Um, but before we actually talk about sort of what's behind that way of working and that way of thinking, mm -hmm. including your latest project, um, Permeance, mm -hmm. um, it'd be really lovely if you can actually tell us a little bit more about your background. How did you um, get involved with photography? Um, how did you perhaps get in top involved and interested in architecture and anthropology? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for asking. Um, so I'm actually an architect. I graduated as an architect in 2016, and I've been working as an architect for three years, more or less. Um, and maybe this is already where it starts becoming uh, related to sustainability, because um, mm. in 2019, I quit my job as an architect because I realized that I was trying to be very sustainable on a personal level, you know, also big companies mm -hmm. try to push the, um, the responsibility towards the personal. What can you do as a person to yes. have a more uh, like a more sustainable uh, way of living? But I was realizing that as an architect, I was actually producing so much more damage, uh, waste and a very unsustainable way of, of building mm -hmm. that uh, my private life could not compensate for. So professionally, I was very dissatisfied. Um, and also the industry of architecture is very slow in change, I feel. Um, it is like a big uh, network of material streams, a lot of people involved. Mm -hmm. So it's very complex to actually change that. Um, so I decided to step out of it. Uh, and that was December 2019, right before COVID uh, hit, kind of. Yes. Uh, not very wise, maybe, to change jobs in that moment, <laughs> uh, in hindsight. But um, I'm very glad I did. Um, and since That's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> since then, I've been on this kind of journey, trying to um, find a way to be professionally more uh, sustainable or more engaged um, and try to understand what also sustainability means, because there are so many uh, interpretations and definitions mm. and it's quite yeah difficult to make your way through it sometimes I feel um, so yeah I actually decided to enroll again as a student in uh, postgraduate degrees which is an advanced master mm -hmm. um, and I'm currently doing both cultural anthropology and um, and also I'm enrolled at uh, the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm, um, where I'm doing also another postgraduate there. So actually, I'm not dealing like with the um, hardcore science, let's say, of sustainability, yes. but I'm approaching it from a more humanistic, artistic perspective. Um, so yeah, actually, that that's a bit how um, yeah how, how I came to be involved also with uh, art and photography in particular. Um, mm. I think I've ha always had the hobby or the interest uh, in photography. Um, I think three years ago, uh, I got involved in analog photography and I was just doing that as kind of recreational hobby. Um, so I think the interest was always there, but it's really through the project I've been carrying out the last year that I discovered the magic of alternative photography and the potential it actually holds to kind of tell this story about um, environmental degradation and yes. uh, also social uh, issues. Um, and yeah, I found it just a great medium. Yeah, absolutely agree with you. It has so many possibilities and um, al alternative photography, historic photography definitely is, I think, um, perhaps opening new doors um for discovery and for for sort of ways of looking like you say looking and considering sort of our sustainability in, in a number of different um areas mm -hmm. um now i've just mentioned permanent i mean i must say must say i'm i'm very um inspired by you doing so much uh, it seems like studying and <laughs> <laughs> so you're very very busy I imagine which is brilliant 
Um, but I've mentioned your current project, mm -hmm. which is um, called Permeance. Yes. Um, and I do want to say a big thank you because you did send me your first iteration of your of a zine all about the project, which is lovely. I was so honored. Um, I was so happy that you asked for it. I, I'm just like, um, please like divulge the <laughs> the booklet. I was sending them off. It was very nice to yeah, people were interested. That was very nice to see. So I'm no, very glad just, that you asked. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really, really um, just a, you know fascinating. Um, uh, story as well behind it um, as well as the images that you're creating and I guess um, for me in a nutshell and I'll obviously ask you to explain it more in your own words but you're looking um, at uh, the river Dommel yeah the Dommel I, yes um, and and your heritage um, aspects of contamination mm -hmm. colonialism mm -hmm. extractivism um I mean, aesthetically as well, it's incredibly beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and you've used something which not many people, I I, I imagine, are, are really aware of or wouldn't necessarily think of it as a photographic process. Mm -hmm. um, but that's um, chromatography and, and using soil cro chromatography to sort of help um, share this project, um, mm -hmm. vo the project's voice. Mm -hmm. But what can you tell me about the project and maybe how it came about, how, mm -hmm. why you felt, you know, the, the urge and the desire to to look at this in particular and, and you know, the fascinating things you've found out because you've done, because you've, you're doing this. Mm -hmm. so it's a quite broad question. I will try <laughs> to uh, have a more linear thought or process hopefully um, but uh, I think well the project actually spans between my two postgraduate degrees so on one side I let uh, anthropology inform more theoretically the project um, mm. so a lot of the um, the bulk of the um, scholarly articles or the academic work the thinking and the theorizing is actually pretty much informed from like anthropologists and philosophers mm. um, on the other hand uh, I have this opportunity since I'm in an, an, uh, an art school uh, to actually uh, integrate artistic research uh, into my project which I was very happy to do so this this past year so yeah. um, on one side yeah the artistic production uh, was some something that I really wanted to do this year and um, um, yeah I was really looking um, forward of doing a photography project because of my interest in analog photography mm. like previous interest but I wasn't I was not convinced that that would be the medium that my project would need um so maybe yeah retracing a little bit um talking about why I, I chose this particular site and how it construct or it led to the concept of permeance mm. um i was during covid i was uh, talking um with my grandmother because she lives here close by and i was a bit taking care of her and she would tell me these stories about when she was younger and she was cycling past this river and how uh, contaminated it was with um, dyes because there were like different industries which were dyeing uh, batik uh, in particular and they were just okay. they were just dumping their chemicals into the river so she said I was I was biking past we were in the, in the Netherlands by the way the, the river okay. Domo is in the Netherlands so she was biking past this river and she would see see it one day completely yellow one day completely blue and she said the sludge which was on oh the on the sides was really disgusting it smelled so incredibly bad um, and then um, she was telling me that in the 70s it started like literally excavating the layers of um, of the riverbanks to kind of mm. move away this contaminated earth and replace it with new kind of uh, earth and mm. I was so intrigued by this story I was like really wondering where does this contamination of contaminated earth go to what do they do to it and to my great disappointment, I learned that not much is done to contaminate earth. Um, mm -hmm. they, they can't really sieve the contamination out or sometimes mm -hmm. they try to burn. The, the techniques are pretty uh, primitive from that point of view. Um, sometimes they just make a hill out of it and they put plastics over it so that, uh, yeah, it kind of cont it's yeah. contained. So um, I was really thinking about these kind of membranes that seclude or that are used to seclude contaminations, both from sight, but also trying to kind of keep it in and how those are impermeable. And um, 
and but of course water gets into it it leaks and so kind of the content contamination continues and is ongoing and that yeah. is actually the very origin of this thought of about permian so how uh, how membranes actually are permeable and they permeate like uh, mm. through each other how there's always an exchange of substances uh, happening and that and how actually it is kind of a modern uh, way of categorizing that we want to separate things, but that in reality, that doesn't really happen. So, um, yeah. yeah. That is almost, almost like sort of the, the, the idea that things are interconnected. Mm -hmm, absolutely. That's where the entanglement uh, mm -hmm. comes from as well. Um, so, so, yes. Um, uh, so I started developing this theoretical framework, which then helped me really uh, understand better uh, and guide my my process. Um, so yeah, the, the 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 permeability actually so op operates both at this microscopic level of uh, exchanges of substances, chemical mm -hmm. and physical exchanges, but at the same time. Um, I, I was able to trace uh, or use contaminants as tracers, so you can you can really kind of um, make make a chain of events that lead you uh, to the origins of a certain material. For example, in this case, the contamination mm -hmm. of the River Domo. Um, I discovered the, the biggest contaminants were uh, cadmium, mm -hmm. which is a heavy metal, and tracing it back, I discovered that it came from an industry which is across on the Belgian border. And they uh, they do zinc smelting processes there, and okay. they uh, produce these contaminants which they dump into the river. Uh, and so I was able to trace it back to the industry, and then from the industry, somehow also going through kind of a space time uh, moment, we are also able to kind of uh, connect it to where is this zinc coming from, and then. And there you see that it comes from all across the world, in particular Australia, and why, and then looking at the wow. story of the mine there you learn about the extractivism that is happening the environmental degradation that is happening there and at the same time you start asking questions about who is the land the extraction is happening on so then you get entangled into colonialism so in this in a sense um the very local history of a very small river pollution here in the netherlands becomes entangled with a history of colonialism on the other side of the world and I think that is what uh, it boils down to for me is to start somehow a local conversation here with people of my yeah. city and try to bring the awareness that the, the local and the small pollution that is happening here has actually a very macroscopic history uh, behind it. And that we have to not only deal with scraping down the riverbanks of this river, but it's actually understanding how this is all interconnected at the, a bigger global scale. And I think permeability or permeance for me, or this concept uh, enabled me to create these links and at the same time understand how how they operate and how they are interconnected. And um, so, yeah, I was in need of a, of something. A conversation started that would bring people uh, who, who would uh, would will call, how do you say it will catch people' attention. And that was um, yes. that was the chromatography for me. I really casually stumbled upon uh, Hannah Fletcher's uh, yes. workshop which you she had was my, yeah she was my first um my your first, first guest on, yeah <laughs> <laughs> I love the very first episode I was so happy that you had her on and oh brilliant um so I stumbled across her workshop and uh and it clicked I was like that is it that's what I've been looking for um, brilliant it all it works through absorption so it was just perfect and it shows the pollution it like it visually uh, yes. translate something that is microscopic it's invisible pollution is like heavy metal pollution is not particularly visible you can see the effect it has on the environment like plant mm. species die animals die but you don't see it really and I thought well this kind of visualizes the compounds uh, in a mixture like earth mixture so mm. you can you could potentially see it and that was for me kind of um yeah the, yeah the reason why i went th uh, into this chromatographic process um and why i left also and the yeah the more classic camera derived images go because those kind of remain on the surface i feel if you make a mm. picture you don't really see the inside or the composition of, of something well I, I i really wanted to show that 
Um, so yeah, that is how and why I chose for chromatography, I think. Yeah, and I, I think works exactly in, in the way I imagine, you know, for, for this project, for this um, sharing of this history and starting the conversations, um, having something that perhaps is, is um, not obvious what it's about and sparks that that um that interest to get those conversations going mm -hmm. um i i do and i might be wrong here but was it actually i mean it's quite fascinating as well with your zine and reading the the sort of the, the story and sort of almost the journey over to to australia and i think it was a a, a dutch um colonial navigator mm. is that right it was the first european in in australia so you know just those yeah. sort of elements of of um of awareness that people you know not everybody would would perhaps know about mm -hmm. and and sort of how that all ties ties it in and obviously mm -hmm. back to um like you say sort of from from where you are mm -hmm. to the other side of the world and, and back again yes um, yes it, it is indeed um well i think it's a it's a, a history which um from my perspective, I'm also very like aware of my positionality as a white Western uh, mm. female, um, and I really would like to create this bond between like the environmental local degradation and the history of colonialism. And I, I did kind of um, initiate this kind of connection in my zine or my booklet, um, and it is indeed also a Dutch navigator who kind of stumbled upon when he when he was. Uh, uh, navigating in that area he casually stumbled upon the shores mm -hmm. he thought it was I think Papua New Guinea or something else okay. but uh, he, he was a bit lost um, <laughs> but um, I also really don't like telling this story from my perspective because it is this, the history of yes. kind of this colonial discovery and I feel like this is not uh, per se my place to be telling the story so that's why I, I didn't really go much deeper than that mm. and um uh, well, I mean, it, it is my place to, to tell the story because of the involvement. I still kind of, we still live in a world which has kind of, uh, which I benefit still from the kind of the, yeah. the things that derive from colonialism. So I think it is my responsibility, but at the same time, I would like to tell the story collaboratively with uh, mm. another artist. And this is something I will be kind of pursuing in the coming year um, oh, to, to see if we can have like a discourse or some have type of reactions towards uh, uh, our works uh, or something like that. But um, mm. that is why I don't really delve much deeper into the history uh, or in telling this part of the story myself, because I felt like mm. I need uh, to not be doing this individually. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I was at that actually sort of leads into what my next question really um, is, is going to be, which is, um, you, you've obviously uh, sort of chatted about why you've chosen this particular cameraless technique, mm -hmm. um, but what um, is actually then next for the project? So looking at um, maybe a, you know, sort of collaboratively working with other, other artists or um, mm -hmm. people, uh, you know, sort of over in Australia that, that mm -hmm. could work with you around this this element of, of, of the, the history. Mm -hmm. um, what what is the very next stage for you with the project then it's still so, very much open because um yeah i'm tr still trying to figure out if there isn't any interest i've contacted a few galleries and museums there to see mm. if i can have an open call uh to to look for someone who would like to collaborate with me so if anyone is out there <laughs> let me know <laughs> Um, but at the same time, I also would like to, at, at the moment with, um, I have an exhibition coming up, uh, through which I would also like to raise some money to be able to fund this project and hopefully have someone else on board as well. So mm. it is still very much into, in the making and I'm not sure if, can, if I can say any much more <laughs> on this without being like speculative and like just hoping, hoping. what it might be, uh, <laughs> but, uh. Um, but you are, I think, um, you've mentioned you're, you're having um, an exhibition, I believe, in mid-October. 
Uh, yes, it's coming up uh, the 16th until the 24th of October. Um, it's in the context of a very large uh, design festival or it's called the Dutch Design Week. It's, pre- it's a pretty big event in the city. Mm. Um, and there are a lot of designers and artists uh, who exhibit. And I have mm-hmm. the luxury of having my own small space um, and a bigger space surrounding it, which is part of a collective. And yeah, I will be presenting my project. Very first time uh, um, actually showing uh, this to a large public. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited. This is kind of the, yeah, a very first for me. <laughs> No, that is brilliant. And I understand, um, and do correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I understand with with soil chromatography, it, um, you can, I think, use sort of coffee filter sized papers mm-hmm. um, uh, to, to produce the, the images. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're actually scaling up. Mm hmm. That yeah. now so so how how's that different how are you finding <laughs> finding that element of going from i mean i'm i'm presuming here so please steffi say if i'm wrong that you might have started out on the smaller mm-hmm. the smaller size paper but now and you've very kindly sent through some example images and yes they're probably are they a1 size a Oh, they're, Roughly, they're one, one meter uh, by 60 centimeters. So okay, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's pretty, it's, it's quite large indeed. But uh, yeah, actually um, it started off with, well, with uh, Hannah. Uh, actually, I think, it, I'm not sure if it was her, but uh, I think she's w- definitely one of the very first people who started uh, using chromatography for photographic and artistic purposes. So mm. that is already a huge step, uh, I feel. In uh, yeah, in presenting chromatography to, chromatography uh, to a larger public outside of the scientific uh, kind of realm, mm. and I really love kind of this idea of misusing somehow scientific <laughs> modern um, methodologies and applying them for artistic purposes. So like a huge shout out to to what she did, um, and uh, yeah, I, I learned. Uh, the, the technique which is a scientific technique uh, with circular chromatographies um, it, and also in a very kind of scientific manner of operating because um, mm. the, the image that you get it's is very undisturbed uh, you can have a, like a, a proper scientific reading from them so if you have a particular earth sample you would mm. be able to read the compounds uh, the chemical composition um, mm. In, in kind of the, this distribution you get on the paper uh, where the heavier compounds stay closer by and then they color differently than maybe other compounds and you mm. get you get all these kind of patterns. So it's a very kind of scientific way of operating still, even though it creates beautiful images, which can also be used uh, for fo- photographic purposes. Um, and I think with um, the topic of contaminations and using contaminated soils, um, and I was working in this kind of uh, very scientific way, you know, with with gloves and really trying to yes. not dis- not disturb each kind of little circle of chromatography which was developing. And I was kind of um, critiquing my own way of operating. And I was like, OK, but if I'm so because, um, yeah, I'm also kind interested in this kind of interspecies beyond human approach um okay. where where you are part of this kind of greater uh nat- nat- natural kind of uh, realm and i was kind of mm-hmm. posing myself as this very scientific being operating on this very scientific manner so i i was i was very disappointed in myself at that point so i was <laughs> like okay let's 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 do it differently let's start kind of contaminating the the prints i make themselves so with it like using different soil samples i was kind of not washing things or touching them so that they were kind of interfering with one another and Mm. from there on i i thought okay let's see what happens if i um, if i put two next to each other uh see how they interact different types of soils but like see how they uh, meet in a paper what what happens uh, and then I large, started producing these larger prints, which kind of departed from the scientific reading and are a more a chaotic kind of contaminated meeting of, of the soils of this river because it's still kind of the river. But I just mm-hmm. picked them up in different, uh, different um, um, moments of the river and I was putting them back onto a paper and I was trying to map the contamination of the river through these soils and these kind of chromatographic mm. images I was getting, but all together on one paper. And I started again quite small, I think 30 centimeters by 20 or something. And then 
uh, yeah, scaling it up. And, and now for the exhibition, I'm trying to make these very big uh, kind of prints. But um, yeah, so I, I really like how in the end it's about kind of being subvertive uh, towards mm. this methodology, which is kind of a modern scientific uh, method. Um, so yeah, I, I I have to I have to sort of let you know actually, Steffi, that um, I also work for a, a charity here in the southwest of the UK that um, actually specialises in looking after rivers. Oh wow! Um, and we do have a soil lab. Uh, um, so if you ever get over to the UK, you should come over and. Um, and and sort of how, yeah you you could be a you could disrupt our <laughs> how fascinating I would I would love to I will definitely have to stop by <laughs> yeah definitely but it's absolutely you know the way you are talking about sort of mixing science and the and the art mm -hmm. um they they it's such a good sort of a, a clash I guess of, mm -hmm. of these different disciplines that amazing things can be mm -hmm. um created from that mm -hmm. um you've actually one of the things i just wanted to ask you about was that with the, the the zine that you sent me i mean the the sort of content in that i won't because it'd be lovely if other people can get a copy for themselves as well yeah it's um, free to download on my website by the way um brilliant yes so it's open what, access <laughs> yeah fantastic but i believe that with that you you are now actually also in the process of, of creating a second version yeah so what's what's going what sort of are you doing that might be different or might be an addition in the second version mm -hmm. uh so here after like this first year of uh, experimenting and producing uh, this artistic material and creating this conceptual framework for permeance um i was reflecting uh again, going back to anthropology and reflecting on the work I have done and what it actually had taught me. I really like this kind of moments of theory and then practice and then how the practice actually, how you kind of clash. You mm -hmm. think you can, you're, you're operating in a certain way and then you realize it doesn't work like that in practice. And then you kind of uh, insert that knowledge back into the theory. So I, I went back into the theory and I, I was really reflecting on what I had done and how I had learned from, from chromatography. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things I noticed was uh, the agency that um, Earth has in this process. So I wrote a whole, um, yeah, kind of an article about how I think that it's a collaboration act, uh, chromatography. It's a mm. collaboration between me who collected the soils and who kind of selected and who sets the stage for this kind of process to happen. But mm. at a certain point, uh, actually, I think quite um, interestingly, uh, the, mo the decisive, decisive moment when you decide to take a photo and when you have the most agency as a photography, co photographer mm. actually doesn't exist in chromatography because the moment you add the the kind of the earth solution to the paper the absorptions and the earth compositions and the everything kind of uh you kind of lose control over what is going to yes. happen and i really love that um so I, I really started noticing how yeah in that moment the earth agency kind of um took over um and i of course have the agency to start it and to stop it but in between it's yeah i have like little power over what happens and what shapes or what colors come out of it so um yeah I try, have, i'm sorry yeah I, I just like i think in the next booklet i i will definitely um be integrating more on the, this type of reflection and as well as mm. how i i think that um the, the contamination uh, actually moves into the paper. That's also another thing I really like about chromatography is that it's not a representation of a contaminated soil or a contaminated river. It is actually the contaminated soil itself. It's in the yeah. paper. The contamination is uh, is there. Um, so I, I think I, I also include that. And um, uh, there are so many layers to it and I yeah. think so many different opportunities for, for different thought processes around this and um, mm -hmm. you know just just you mentioning um, then about sort of uh, the the element of you have agency to a point and then the earth it, mm -hmm. it does its thing um, yeah but it's sort of it almost it, it's almost I guess maybe in a very sort of light touch way um, reflects 
you know the impact we do have on the earth mm -hmm. but then if if we leave it it will do its it you know it will start to do its own thing again and, and look after itself and mm -hmm. you get sort of all these different sort of um mm -hmm. tangents that i think your your this project will will open up for, mm -hmm. for people and so many you know great conversations i, mm -hmm. I think are going to come from this so uh, yeah really really loving um all the potential for it yes um, <laughs> but i i think as well what you're hoping to do um in the future i'm not sure if you're quite ready yet um because you've obviously got your exhibition coming up but mm -hmm. i think you might be um at that point um looking to actually create a print sale as well is uh, that still on on target yes absolutely but um i'm still a bit struggling if uh i will sell the originals because as i yeah. said there's like yes. this contamination included into the into mm. the paper so i feel like passing on something uh, contaminated also gives you a responsibility of what yes. you do with this piece um and as long as you don't throw it away uh, it's not waste i suppose but um i don't know i don't i'm not ready to part with the originals <laughs> yet i think so maybe i will just be making prints like copies yes uh, and i will be selling those to finance kind of the research and also the the hopes for uh, developing a collaborative uh, research with someone else mm. so um yeah that will be certainly happening be happening in october um so yeah fantastic <laughs> um now if i was to ask you then um how you think photography or perhaps more specifically um not necessarily cameraless or analog um but how you think the technique of, of photography in, in any form mm -hmm. can actually help us to tell visual stories about our impact on the natural world around us um what do you think we can achieve by working in these ways? Well, what do you hope that we can achieve, mm -hmm. um, if anything, mm -hmm. by doing what we do? <laughs> um, well, for me, as I'm not a photographer, so for me, photography is just was in this case the medium I used because mm -hmm. it was really fitting. Um, at the same at the same time, I also strongly believe in interdisciplinarity. So mm. if you can merge photography with something else, uh, it often leads to more interesting perspectives. But in generally, in general, I think photography um, in this past year made me reflect on kind of the gaze I have in general, like from my mm. Western perspective, what type of viewing of uh, the world I have, um, and I think it enabled me. Uh, to notice certain things and make me more conscious uh, of yeah how I of different ways I could shift my viewing on the world and how that can have effect on what I kind of uh, produce or achieve um, and I think in particular like analog photography um, offers a greater understanding of viewing the world um, it visualizes somehow the non-evident or what mm. is kind of secluded um, in particular, I think chromatography did that for me, uh, visualizing what is not uh, visible to the naked eye. Um, but at the same time, I think it offers a multitude of perspectives, which enables us, again, to kind of speculate about possible futures and also consequently to enact uh, and construct on those alternate futures. So and hopefully those are also sustainable, sustainable futures, of course. Yes. So I think in general, alternative photography enables us to envision kind of the possible, the possible or possible futures. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you can I ask you if you have um, an idea of what your your sort of alternative or possible future might look like? Oh, I think, first of all, it's um, I, I think it's uh, I'm very much into kind of the collaborative side of things. So um, rather than having my individual future, I would like to see multiple kind of uh, futures advanced by people. And I think the resilience of sustainability is actually in kind of diversifying having this kind of diversity of future mm -hmm. envisioned futures so um I, I don't think it matters much of what i envision but it's more like what can we learn from collaboratively having this kind of uh, resilience of multiple alternatives mm -hmm. uh, if it makes any sense <laughs> <laughs> yes no 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 yes yes it does and i guess um we it, it's it's uh 
well no no one can see into the future can they so we can, <laughs> we can only we can only do what um we we think is right if um you know for for the earth and hope that others will perhaps mm. um come along on those um those journeys or 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 sort of tangents and mm -hmm. like you say a collaborative way of of um of looking at things mm -hmm. um and hopefully engage in some conversations just start off by having conversation with people is already a great start i think absolutely and i guess sometimes perhaps not being frightened of having conversations where you might not necessarily have a full understanding around what's mm -hmm. you know the, the the whole um context of of of, uh, of the conversation maybe but um yeah i think fear is sometimes the thing that stops us doing people doing the the right thing mm -hmm. anyway isn't it um, or making mistakes i think yes. that's also a thing <laughs> fear yeah. of making mistakes yeah definitely so absolutely yeah conversations like you and i are having are, absolutely yeah the way forward um and across lots of different um topics as well mm -hmm. and i really love the fact that you 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 know you obviously don't you don't sort of um claim to call yourself a photographer mm -hmm. but you know you are incredibly creative you've used a great process here and i know that you've you like you say you you've got the love for your using analog um um, processes and that there is some other work that you've done um, photographic work on your website mm. so <laughs> if people were going to find, want to find out oh, that is great if going to find out about you um mm -hmm. where do they need to head um to find out more a website and any social media yes so uh, i hope you will put the links in the description because my name is it's a bit tricky to kind of spell out but it's um you can find me on my website stefidegaetano.net or yeah. on uh, instagram uh, also stefidegaetano so yeah uh, those are the two places i i post the most and keep up to date so fantastic and um so after i mean there's so much going on for you with permeance i mean but but do you have any plans and after october other than perhaps having a complete rest <laughs> oh uh not in the near future unfortunately <laughs> i would really want to rest but i don't think uh, there's time for it so and i actually i yeah it gives you me a lot of energy to work on this type of thing so um yeah i'm really happy to be doing this i'm really happy that i had the chance to do this so uh, brilliant uh, yeah I will just keep going I think <laughs> no absolutely and I've really really loved my my chat with you same and, um I could probably we could probably as usual talk an awful lot more um but I'd really like people to go along and make sure like you say your website and your your social media are in the links for the podcast um I'd love people to go along and, and have a look maybe download your your book um and find out more and hopefully you never know perhaps um you can get someone getting in touch to to see if there's a, a collaborative opportunity there that would be um, great <laughs> which yeah I, I which would be wonderful and do please keep keep me posted if um if that does happen absolutely um we we can always chat again and as i say if you're ever heading over to the uk um come and have a look at the rivers where i am i'm really intrigued i will i will definitely <laughs> well thank you so much steffi it has been really lovely chatting with you and absolutely best of luck with with the project and with the upcoming exhibition and new work thank you for having me it was a lovely conversation thank you bye bye Ciao. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening in. I hope you really enjoyed that. Do please head over and have a look at Steffi's work on her website or follow her on Instagram. I'd really love to chat to you too. If your photography tries to raise the profile of environmental issues or if you perhaps are trying to work in a more sustainable way through your photography, whatever it is, if it relates to our natural world and ways of sharing stories and raising profiles so that we can all perhaps try and do a little bit more for for nature then do please get in touch you can visit my website at josiepurcellphotography.com and send me a message 
or just head over to Instagram and find me there at Josie Shutterpod. So hope to be chatting to you again soon. Bye.